My name is uh, Gil Tayar. I'm a software architect at a company called Wix, which some of you may, have, may know. It's a company that helps you build websites, very similar to our biggest, one of our biggest competitors, WordPress, if you have seen the previous uh, talk. Uh, I actually have a history with uh, the Netherlands, or not. Hmm. There we go. This is me at the age of six. I lived here for three years, uh, first grade, second grade, third grade. So yeah, uh, I have a history of, you know, the herring, the, the frit and everything uh, reminds me of uh, my childhood. Uh, this is 80-something, actually 70-something, now that I remember. So I want to talk about uh, something we did, something I did for a week, seven days. Uh, there was a Wix internal hackathon at Wix, uh, December 2015, and I want to talk about what we did there at the, that hackathon. And I want to show it as a movie in six scripts, prologue, the plan, the job, the change of plan, as always, and then it all comes together in epilogue. So let's talk about prologue. Wix, we are hiring, not in the Netherlands, so, yeah, but the, the reason I'm talking about Wix is um, uh, we're an Israeli company, uh, we have 80 million customers, Two million of them are paying, and it's all relevant. Uh, you don't really need to know about Wix. The, 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 the interesting thing is the statistics. We have 80 million users, two billion requests per day, HTTP requests per day. Those are serviced by 200 microservices, and we have over 100 deployments of those microservices per day. We are very, very agile in that I can fix a bug, click a button, and it's just get pushed to production, uh, tested there internally, and, and voila, it's, it's out there. So we have 100 de uh, deployments of 200 microservices. Unfortunately, the microservices infrastructure that we deploy and run our microservices on is getting old. And as I said, on two th in December 2015, we had a, an internal hackathon. And I was thinking, what do we do this year? And it, it's, it, 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 it happened that you know a few weeks back, I was very, very pissed off from our uh, very aging uh, deployment infrastructure. It took a lot of time to deploy. It, 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 was it that bad? No. Uh, it's a miracle that we have it. I mean, we built it like... Um, Five years ago, I don't know exactly, I, w I wasn't there at the time, but uh, it, it was built at times when people didn't do those things, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that we have it, but it's chef-based, so it's very, very slow. The blue-green deployment is suboptimal. Does somebody know what blue-green deployment is? Okay, blue-green deployment is when you're trying to upgrade a version of a microservice or whatever, and you want to keep everything alive, so you deploy it on a few servers, and then when those are deployed, you have the old version and the new version at the same time, and then you deploy a bit more, a bit more, and a bit more, kill all those old services until you have the new version uh, living and the old version is gone. Uh, and the rollbacks. The rollbacks are incredibly slow. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I know, how many rollbacks do you have? Where well, we are agile, and yes, sometimes our tests don't find the bugs that we find in production, so we need to roll back. And when you have that bug in production, you want it to be fast. Not only that, not only is it slow, uh, it has static definitions of where each microservice is installed on which server. So we have this big list of on server foo, I have A, B, and C. On service bar, I have B, C, and D. And this will, cha we will never change. I can move things around, but I need to move it manually. I need to understand, oh my god, this server is very, very busy. It has lots of microservices, and this one isn't, so I'll put it here. But maybe this will get busy. And it's, 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 a, it's, it's a big, big mess. And unfortunately, people 
and, and various microservices team get very intimate with the specific servers they are running on. They, they know them um, as a friend or in, in, in some cases as an enemy. This is, this is not good. And for me, the, most, the biggest problem is we have staging infrastructure and we have end-to-end -end tests which are very similar to production. And both of those use different infrastructures to build them. If we could have had the same infrastructure, that would have been perfect. So I asked myself, can I rebuild it? Can I rebuild it in a week? Uh, if you think about it, I, I thought not. But then again, God created the universe in seven days. So just the microservices infrastructure. Maybe I can. So I asked the five best and brightest of, uh, of Wix. Oh, no, that's not them. Yeah, that's it. I asked the five best and brightest. I said, hey, why don't we build a new microservices deployment infrastructure? And they liked the idea. So we had a team. We had an idea. And on to part two, the plan. Who knows Reservoir Dogs? Who thinks it's the best Tarantino movie? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, uh, the plan. Um, we had to plan it, but we started planning on the day of the hackathon. We didn't cheat. We didn't cheat. We just had the idea uh, before the hackathon. But on the day of the hackathon, December 15th, we started planning. And we started to figure out what was the scope. We, we can't really build the whole thing. It's huge. Uh, but what was the scope? And we decided, okay, let's assume that we want to deploy uh, uh, two microservices. W we could deploy any, any number of microservices, but this was the scope. A web service, which has a public uh, en entry point, so you could access it from the web. And the web service talks to the RPC service via an RPC interface, which at Wix, we have this kind of RPC, homegrown RPC service uh, based on... Uh, JSON RPC, HTTP based, uh, et cetera. So that's the scope. Can we do this? And the other thing is, what do we need to do? We wanted to, instead of building a UI that does deployment, like a lot of people do, we decided in building a CLI. And that was brilliant, because we're backend people. We don't understand that uh, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, where we're more uh, Scala, message pools, and uh, you know, thread, thread pools and message queues. So we wanted an uh, 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 a CLI, and we wanted to enable deploying a, a web service of a certain version on, let's say, 20 instances. And we wanted to be able to access it from, uh, from, uh, from, the public, uh, from the public entry point. Obviously, it should do the RPC. And we wanted the ability to upgrade it using blue-green. Blue-green? Blue-green uh, deployment. So I, I want to upgrade 1.5 to 1.6. And you know what? Let's up it to 30 instances of that microservices. OK. And we wanted to have some marketing. That we had on the first to the second day. This is, this is my nephew. He's like Photoshop -y thingy. So that's what he built. I, I love the tagline, deploy like a boss, because it's built on Mesos. Um, and the scheduler. Let, let's talk about what, it, what, what, what do we do when we build a microservices infrastructure. And the most important thing is the scheduler. What does a scheduler do? What is a scheduler? This is a graphic depiction of a server farm. Um, lots of computers, lots of servers hosted somewhere. And these are microservice instances that we want to run. We have A, B, C, D, and E. OK, those are the microservices. And we want lots and lots of instances running on the server farm. So what does a scheduler do? The scheduler, I tell it, I need 20 A's, 10 B's, 15 C's, and I want it pronto on the double. And that is what it does. It, it schedules, it runs the microservice instances, the processes on the servers. And it keeps them healthy. So if a process goes down, it regenerates it. And if a host goes down, if a server goes down, 
it, it, it finds somewhere else for those, for, for those uh, processes to run. It takes care of that automatically. Which scheduler do we use? Mesos Marathon, Mesos Aurora, Nomad, Kubernetes, those are just names, I don't want to get into them. We chose, we chose, we chose, we chose, oh. This is strange. There we go. We chose Mesos Marathon. And why did we choose Mesos Marathon? Because, what does it matter? It's a hackathon. We had this guy, <laughs> we know, yeah, you, you were ready for pros and cons, oh, come on. We had this guy and he, he was this, he has, he has a basement with five servers and he built stuff on it and he knows Mesos Marathon and he had these great scripts that, you know, deploy them everywhere. So he said, hey, wait, why not? And in a way, that's not a bad way to choose something. It's not the, you know, the whole tables with the pros and cons and what, do our, what are our requirements and all that. I don't believe in that. I think the soft advantages are the more important advantages. And Mesos Marathon has a great, uh, lots of people use it in production. It has a very good community, has very good support. I think it's a good uh, choice uh, nevertheless. What's the second thing we need? Now we have a scheduler. We need service discovery. What is service discovery? So we have three kinds of service discovery. I put them in, you know, everybody has a different uh, um, definition of it. This is mine. Three kinds. One is I'm, I'm, I'm going in a browser and I'm typing wix.com slash w slash whatever. Which microservice will it point to? And where are those microservices go? Uh, where are those microservices hosted? So somebody needs to route that request, that HTTP request, to the specific instance of the specific web service. That's one kind. Second kind is I'm doing an RPC call from a web service to an RPC service. So the web service needs to, in the end, find out where one of the instances of the RPC service is. That's another kind of service discovery. And the third one, that, let's say, that RPC service needs to find a database. Where is that database in all those hosts? That's the third kind of service discovery. And the third kind, we put it, it was out of scope. Too much work. Okay, let's talk about, we thought about how to implement web service discovery. That's the big one where the public endpoint uh, needs to find the correct microservice. And the answer, from our standpoint, point of view, was let's put a gateway in the middle. So the user, when it types wix.com slash w, doesn't reach immediately the server, it reaches a reverse proxy, a gateway, okay? Which reads the rules from somewhere, which says slash w is web service A, slash z is web service B, and reverse proxies the HTTP request to the correct instance of the correct service. That's, that's the way we think uh, it should be done. I think in, 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 in web service discovery, that's probably the only way you can do it. Which proxy should we use? It's a reverse proxy. Which proxy should we use? HA proxy and Nginx. Why did we choose Nginx? So why did we choose Nginx? Because we have experience with it in, uh, at Wix for various other uh, purposes. It's really great, low resource, zero cost. Why not use it? And where are the rules? Where are the rules which says slash W is A, slash Z is B? We chose a hackathon solution. We just kept them in the source control along with the code. And we rationalized it as a good decision because configuration is source code. That's, that's the mantra we used. Is that a rationalization or is that a good design decision? I don't know, I'll let you decide, I'm not sure. At that time, it was a perfect design decision. Okay, so it knows to go to service A if I do slash W, but where are the instances? 
I mean, they're all over the place on lots of, uh, on lots of machines, in this case, host one and host two. Where are they deployed to? Where, where can it find them? And the answer is, well, it will query Mas Mesos Marathon. It will just query, it says, Web Service A, I need Web Service A, where are they? Mesos Marathon will return there, here and here and here and here and here. I'll choose one randomly or round robin or whatever, and there we go, we have it. Next in, in line, RPC service discovery. So our web service wants to uh, uh, RPC to RPC, uh, an RPC service. We chose the same solution. There's a different solution which is called client-side uh, service discovery. We didn't choose it because our RPC service, our RPC infrastructure at Wix doesn't really support that kind of solution. So we, and we wanted to use uh, a web service code uh, that is Wix code and not you know, our own. So we built a gateway. We wanted to build a gateway, which again, reverse proxies and routes to the correct web service instance. See the resemblance? Very, very similar to web service discovery. Okay, so again, we decided we want to use Nginx. But where are the rules? Where does it say this HTTP call points to this RPC service? And the answer is, in this case, no rules. It's by convention. And, and that is something that the Wix uh, web service, uh, RPC service infrastructure gives us. So all RPC calls will go to rpc.int, which we will uh, uh, configure to point to our gateway, and all of them will have as the first path segment the name of the RPC service, service A or service B, and the gateway will look at the first path segment and route it to the correct instance. That's easy. Where are the instances? So it knows to go to RPC service A, but there are lots of them. Again, Mesos Marathon, same difference, nothing to uh, um, write home about. And let's recap, because it's a lot of design decisions, let's recap the whole flow. So we have this uh, uh, um, developer, and she wants to deploy um, A and B. So she says, please, so the Apollo, we called it Apollo, Apollo deploy goes to Marathon and says, please create service A, please create service B. I need two instances of each. And this is the Docker image you need to deploy, A. And we already have Docker uh, support at Wix, so when we build a service in our CI, in our continuous integration system, it builds a Docker image for it. And Marathon just, you know, finds the servers that are least uh, um, uh, dense and just runs uh, the microservices on them and keeps them healthy. And if one dies, it'll regenerate. All good. Now the user, the end user, goes to wix.com slash apath and goes to the web gateway. Remember, service discovery. The web gateway looks at the rules, sees it, go, it needs to go to service A, and queries Marathon. Where is service A? And it says here and here. And it chooses randomly or round robin, and we're done. Now service A goes and calls b.foo, and this is interpreted by our RPC uh, client as this URL, which it posts to. This goes to the RPC gateway. RPC gateway looks and sees it needs service B, queries Marathon, finds one of them, and there we have it. This is our design. Nice plan. <laughs> now comes the hard part, the job. So this took us about half a day half a day, three quarters of a day, now we have to do the work. So we split the job into five pieces, five people, five pieces. System, the sample web service, I'll talk about it. Let's talk about the system first. System is, um, this is, this is my, our biggest cheat. We, we cheated there because we had that guy that knows, that builds scripts, you know. He already had a script an Ansible script, uh, who, for those who know Ansible, that creates a Mesos Marathon on the local Vagrant machine. All, the, he, all he needed to do was uh, create it on Amazon, too, on Amazon VMs. We had eight Amazon VMs ready for us. 
So we built Ansible scripts that created uh, those processes on those machines. Okay. This is an example Ansible script. It's, it's words. It's just words. I have no idea what it is. But he has the best words. Yes. Uh, now the sample RP, uh, web service and RPC service, that's easy. Um, regular Wix services, we have our own framework for building them. Easy peasy, nothing to write home about. I just want to show you how an, an RPC call is done. So this is the, uh, let's look at the last line. This is the call to an RPC service. It's just a regular Java call. And to build that RPC client, we have to give it a, a, a path, a domain. And what is the first segment of the path? And the domain, we said, OK, the, the, the Docker image will get it as an environment variable, RPC underscore int, RPC internal. And once we have those two lines, the RPC infrastructure will post to that URL. So that's the sample RPC service. That was, that, that was the easiest. Deployment via CLI. As I said, we wanted to do it in, um, in command line. We chose Node because we know Node the best in, in terms of command line. Uh, let's look at the code for deploying an instance to Marathon. The, this code that does artifact deploy. It's, this is almost real code. It's, you know, simplified, but this is true. We, um, Marathon.client is just an HTTP request which does a put and says what the, ba the app ID is, which is, the app ID is just the service name with stuff, and we give it a JSON. The JSON is just information about how Marathon is supposed to create the instances. So you can see it creates, at the last line, it creates a number of instances based on the number of instances we want. The Docker image is up there. It's just the service name and the version. With the environment variable is the RPC internal. Uh, I don't want to get into why it's localhost. That, that's for another discussion. And the labels will help the service discovery figure out that this is service A. OK. So what, what, what happens when we do this HTTP put? Marathon will see how many instances need to be deployed, use Mesos to deploy them on our hosts, waits for them to be alive using the health check. If you notice, there's a health check here, um, almost last lines. And the configuration is not a one-off. Marathon will always strive for this to be true. So if one of them fails, it will pull them back up, and we'll see how this helps when upgrading. Uh, actually, what about upgrading? How does upgrading work? And the answer is, we didn't change anything. We didn't change anything. It's the same lines of code. Notice that the app ID is the same. So we're replacing the old configuration, which says 1.5, with the new configuration, which says 1.6. And Marathon does the rest. I mean, this is the really, 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 really hard part. And Marathon just does it. It, sees, it says, OK, I have 20 instances of 1.5, 0 instances of 1.6. I need 30 instances of 1.6. Let's start doing the blue-green creating these, killing these slowly until I have zero of those and, one point, and 30 of 1.6. Marathon does it, and, and it's beautiful. Uh, so upgrading is as easy as just the regular uh, inst uh, deploy. So as I said, Mar Marathon notices, well, I talked about it. So we had that. How much time did it take us to build these three things? We're good. But we're not 10 times, you know, the myth of the 10 times uh, programmer. We're not that. So how much time did it take us? Three days. Just three days. It's that easy. It's not a lot of code. What about those? That's a problem. Because we put systems guys on it and not developers. And system guys know how to develop, and they're very good at development. But you know, in a hackathon, the, the, real, the regular developers can you know, just do the hackathon thing, but production never stops. And they had production problems, so this stalled for us. So what do we do? We change the plan. We do third-party service discovery, which I will skip in the interest of time, but we did it. 
What else? And now this comes to the interesting part. We did staging. And from my point of view, this is the most important addition we did. And it changed the whole way Wix saw this project uh, completely. For, from the new perspective, production is just another environment. And there are more environments on the same hosts at the same time. So in a way, if you look at this, uh, Produ uh, the, what, st what stage it is on, what environment it is on, is just a coloring of the microservices, and we need to make sure that the same colors see the same instances and not you know, different colors see different instances. How does this look inside the CLI? We just added another environment, uh, another variable, another parameter, minus E, stage one, as an example and it will deploy this web service on the stage one environment. And the, from the browser's point of view, we said, okay, let's add a, uh, on the domain, we add stage1.wix.com, and it, know, it will know to go to the stage one uh, instances and not to the production instances. Web service discovery should just know it. It should just proxy and load balance to the correct instance of the correct environment. Same for RPC services. How will the RPC services know? Well, the RPC int thing, the domain that they get, remember from the environment variable, it won't be rpc.int, it will be stage1.rpc.int, and the proxy from that will know to deploy to the correct instance. Third party instances, I'll skip. And it all came together in the end. Incredibly enough, the RPC guys, oh, that's strange. The RPC guys, uh, the service discovery guys finished their work, and we had three more days, huh, and we had three more days uh, of work and we finished. Let's talk about how they did the, uh, let's talk about how they did the service discovery. They had a manager and Nginx. They used Nginx, but they had a manager next to it, and Marathon, obviously, to figure out where the instances are. So how does it work? Every 10 seconds, the manager wakes up and says, oh, let's query Marathon for all its microservices. And how does it know which uh, Marathon process is which microservice? Via the labels we wrote, so it knows this process is this micro instance, this process is that micro instance, et cetera, et cetera. So we query Marathon, get back the list of all the processes, know what microservices instances are, and we update the Nginx conf. If we know what they are, we can just create a configuration file that makes Nginx do the reverse proxying itself. Once we do that, we restart Nginx. And Nginx has this restart option where it knows not to fail, not, not to have downtime. It well, uploads one process. Once this is alive, it turns off the other one. So that's it. This is how we built the RPC service discovery. What language do we use? Well, interestingly enough, one guy used Node, and the other guy, Bash, which is interesting. Um, but hey, it's, it's a hackathon. It's not my, my choice, but it was his. And I want to show you the code, because Bash is easier. Uh, I, I, we're not going to go over it. I want to show, this is most of the code of the RPC service discovery code. It's like about three times more. That's about it. And this is the main code of the RPC service discovery. It goes and it curls Marathon, gets back the instances as JSON, and uses this cool JQ tool to flesh out the information and build the Nginx conf. That's it. Another three days, and we were done. So let's recap. We deploy to stage. This does a post for the configuration, which says what the number of instances are, gives the environment variables for each third-party service and the Docker image to use. Marathon creates the instances. The web gateway and the RPC gateway, every 10 seconds, query the rules and queries Marathon and builds an engine XConf that will be used for service discovery every 10 seconds. Now comes the user. The user 
uh, gets an HTTP request, creates an HTTP request to the Nginx. The manager is out of uh, scope here, just the Nginx. The Nginx just uses the Nginx conf to route to the correct instance round robin. This one calls via HTTP RPC to the RPC gateway, which already has the Nginx conf to call service B, to proxy to service B. And there we have it. This is what we built in seven days. Epilogue. We won, we won the hackathon. I got a nice day massage with my wife. Uh, and the end result, we have a microservices infrastructure supporting red-green, not red-green, red-blue deployment, third-party services, staging environments, and actually also dev environments because it can run on Vagrant uh, locally for the, uh, use, for, for the developer. And we built it in six days. And what did we do on the seventh day? We rested. We're Jewish, aren't we? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> questions. Oh, please, please ask questions. I want to throw this. OK. OK, cool. Um, so I wanted to ask you, oh, sorry, about some specifics. Uh, problems that you may have encountered. Uh, the first one would be about session affinity. So if we all build services, we know that sometimes we want to build caches. And because we have caches in our services, we want to continuously hit that instance rather than hitting another one. And then if the instance goes down, we're going to hit another, and the cache will reform. But actually, same user, same instance, if possible. This is called session affinity. So did you have this problem, and how did you solve it? Yes, Wix, uh, the, the Wix solves this problem uh, by not having it. We are specifically forbidden uh, to do session affinity, <laughs> and I think that's a good thing. Uh, we use caches, but it's, you know, memcache or whatever, uh, Redis, to, to uh, each one to, to get whatever information is needed. So, uh, sorry, I, c I can't help you there. That's cool. I, I know how I did it, so no problem. <laughs> Great. Second question. Yes. Uh, geolocation of services. If you have a big organization, you may have services located around the world. Yes. Specifically, uh, you can have some services in the USA, because that's better to serve USA customers, then some services in Singapore, you want to serve China, and some services in Europe, because you want actually to serve also Europe. It might be the Netherlands also. So when a call arrives to you, you may need to direct to the nearest service. And you have this problem even service to service. So service A, I want to talk to service B, and I want to find the nearest one. I don't want from New York end up calling a service in Singapore just because it has the same label. So did you have this problem? How did you solve it? Well, obviously, we, in the hackathon, we didn't have this problem. Uh, Wix. Someone has this problem. It, it, it solves it by, uh, well, the biggest problem is, is for, for, from Wix's perspective, is more of a, a media problem, images, videos, etc. We solve this by using CDNs. Yeah, as, as for services, we, we are multi-data center, but only for um, uh, resiliency, not for being close to the user. Okay, so we don't. But the answer for, for I, I think I do have an answer, and you know it's off the cuff, so don't don't shoot me if it's wrong. Is uh, multi data center, you know, a geo geo location is is usually done using let's say DNS kind of things. Once you do that, you get to the right data center. That data center will proxy only inside its its circle. So I don't really think that should be a problem, but I. Don't really know. I, I believe you can show up. Uh, you, you have to use the mic, otherwise nobody yeah, else in the future, in the future I, nobody I will it. hear it. <laughs> uh, so the last thing, so done to okay. ask you, then I will throw the mic to somebody else, hopefully. Um, from hackathon to production, this system. So you, you did seven days, seven day rested, and then you wanted to go 
live with this thing, right? And then you have your 200 services to, you know, put into configuration and everything and test everything. So how long did it take and uh, which was the process? It didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, we, we won two day uh, massage thing, but, but um, it didn't reach production. I would have preferred reaching production for a massage. There were lots of really, really good projects at the hackathon. Nobody could do it all. But I think what happened at Wix was that it resonated. And people start thinking about that. And there's a group that starts thinking about this. Hopefully, they'll take us as a basis and continue from there. But this is a toy. I mean, to take this and make it really robust, I would argue that it's like two, three months of a dedicated like two, three people team. I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's, it's not that good. Uh, I think it, it more explains what are the components of a microservices infrastructure rather than showing how to do it robustly. So I hope it will happen. I'm assuming it will happen uh, in a year, uh, but that's all I can give. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, no. Come on. No, I wanted to throw it. Okay, we have a, we have a contender. <gasps> Her? Oh, him. Yeah. Oh, oh I, d I didn't see, sorry. Oh, oh, I didn't forget you. Uh, so just a small question, what's Apollo? Apollo, <laughs> it was a cool name for the project. But it's your own too. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, we wrote the Node.js code. Thanks. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> RPC service discovery gone bad. <laughs> uh, so you wrote your own service discovery uh, kind of thing. Uh, did you also consider uh, consider other using other frameworks like console or ATCD or whatever? Yes, we did. Because. Because. Yes, and actually, uh, we did rationalize it as usual. I mean, all, all design decisions are rational, okay? And the rational thing is, we have multi data center, and we want to route. Sometimes we want to route a specific one to another data center. My guess is that Wix's requirements. Uh, it will be difficult to implement that. We want control. Okay. Okay. But it is a rationalization. We didn't think it through all the way. Definitely. Uh, any other questions? Yes, over there. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So, uh, in the colored uh, diagram you showed, uh, you can put the same application uh, in the same physical host, but different environments. Yes. So, uh, if you have, for example, service A, uh, staging and production, or test and production, um, don't you have the noisy neighbors problem if one of the engineers schedules a stress test to the service A test? What happens to the production if the buffers that, fill and That's whatever? an excellent question. I, I glossed over it because uh, teaching is cheating. I heard it. Uh, <laughs> and the answer is, I will never mix production and staging. <laughs> but, but, so production will be a real environment. It could host others, but no. It has to be production. And then we'll build the same environment for all the staging and testing uh, yeah, environments. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's yeah, that, that was what we will do. Yes. Any other questions? Over there. But I'm not a good problem. Why do you have this? strange requirements for the instances when you specify the number of instances. Why not use to, to, to use auto-scaling group or something? Ah. Well, well, the reason is hackathon one. Two, auto-scaling isn't that easy. And my guess is that once we build this, and I believe we will build this really, auto-scaling will come naturally. OK, so once we have this, Telling Marathon, you know what, we don't need 20, we need 30, will be very, very easy. We saw how easy it is. So uh, my guessing is it will come naturally as uh, an evolution of this. So the answer is why time? Uh, and, and we never did it before. And, uh, but yes, it is a good thing to do. Any other question? Thank you very much. I had a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs>